You are listening to Mining Stock Education, where you'll learn from the top leaders in the natural resource sector and uncover quality mining investment opportunities. But I think in Q3 or Q4, we're going to see a correction in the markets. Then we're going to find out. We're going to find out if this if the correction gets bought. If the correction gets bought, then gold will be remain stuck. If the, if the correction doesn't get bought, then you're going to see a flip and the fear will kick in. Investors will go, whoa, whoa, it didn't get bought. Maybe people aren't going to buy stocks anymore. And then that's when gold will start trending. All you need is basically three green candles in a row. So let's say gold sells off. My range is 1550 to 1650. I'm hoping 1650 is as low as we go. Um, let's say gold sells off to 1650 and then it gets three green candles in a row. 1660, 1680, 1710. It gets three grand candles in a row and it's off to the races. That's my feel. It's like they won't be able to stop it. Thanks for tuning in to Mining Stock Education. I'm your host, Bill Powers, and we're chatting today with Don Durrett of goldstockdata.com. If you're not familiar with Don's service, it's very affordable. He covers a lot of different junior mining companies, gives his uh, just kind of his assessment using his template of how he analyzes a company. Go over and check that out. But Don, welcome back onto the program. And uh, you're a long-term investor in precious metals. I read your book many, many years ago now. And when you look at a company, you're assuming gold's going to be at least $2,500 plus, or we're not there. And in fact, we just had a flash crash a couple of days ago. So give us your analysis. How do you interpret this flash crash? Why did it happen? What does it mean? Um, yeah, so I'll give you that answer. But first, I I wanted to kind of correct you there. You said that I ex invest in gold stocks um, expecting $2,500 gold. Um, so I that's kind of the upside. So I value, um, I try to value stocks based on their current market cap compared to their future market cap as estimated using future gold prices and their future cost. And the, and the future gold price that I use is 2,500. So that's kind of like a the, somewhat of a theoretical maximum is like, this is your highest. So let's say that a company, and then basically a company will print at a certain number. So once you, you, when you use throw those numbers together, let's say you get a 10 bagger. So it prints as a 10 bagger at 2,500. So that's kind of like your upper level. Um, so if I'm seeing that kind of upside, you know, I'm, yeah, I mean, I could get it. I mean, I'm exp I'm expecting 2,500, but if it goes to say 2,100, 2,200, I'm gonna get three, four bagger, right? So, it's it's really kind of looking at you know kind of what is your upper limit or what's your what do you, what are your what's your potential? So, I, and I try to only invest in companies that have an upside potential of of three to five baggers. So I don't I don't look at companies under that, and I, I'm really looking for my ideal company. Somebody, a company that's valued somewhere like between 50 and 150 million dollars currently, and they basically print as uh, somewhat of a solid five bagger with 10 bagger potential. That's kind of my sweet spot, it's kind of what I look for. Um, so I'm looking for a high alpha, absolutely, but not necessarily. A you don't have to get to 2500, you can find undervalued companies. Um, that are going to make money, make you a lot of money and say $2,200 gold, somewhere there. But with the expected outcome, that was my point, because I believe you even wrote that in your book, the expected outcome, if yeah. everything lines up, you do use that $2,500 gold yeah. as your input yeah. and your yeah, assumption yeah. in that model. Yeah, that's what I use the value companies at 2,500. That's kind of my the number I use. So, so I don't, you know, some people are, are, care about what a company's doing right now. And then this goes into your question, you know, the, the flash crash. So we, I don't know if it was a flash crash, but we definitely had a hundred dollar crash in gold the last three days. Um, I don't necessarily value companies on what they're doing right now. That's not my concern. Um, as long as a company is solvent, and I think they're going to remain solvent, I'm really focusing on what they're going to do in the future. You know, companies like a good example is like I am gold. People are saying I am gold is a dog. Well, yeah, I mean, it's not performing well right now, but I don't care about that. As long as they don't have a really bad balance sheet that they're going to go bankrupt, as long as they're going to stay in business, that I think they're going to stay in business, say, over the next three to five years. And I look at their future production. Uh, then I get excited and I look at their future cash flow. So I'm not really focusing on today. 
um, very little focus on today other than do they have quality properties? Do they have a quality management team? Uh, you know, what's in their pipeline? What are they building? You know, I look at those factors, yes, but I'm really focusing out to what, you know, what the company is going to become. That's, you know, it's kind of more projection. It's like, why, why do you invest in gold and silver mining companies at today's prices expecting to make money? It's too risky. There's just way too much risk. If you're not going for high alpha, you're wasting your time. That's the way I look at it. Or you could do physical gold, physical silver. But if you're going to do miners, I think you have to go after high alpha because of the risk. And now this, this dovetails into your question. So your question was, okay, Don, can you tell us why, you know, gold and silver cr crashed here the last two days? So we had this sell off on Friday. So let me focus on that. So that just kind of rolled over into Asia on Sunday night. So the crash happened because the US, uh, when the US markets are open, Asia's closed. So they have to come, they come in the next day. So we had this big sell off on Friday based on the jobs reports. So the jobs numbers came in really strong. And I've always said this, that gold is, it's kryptonite is the economy. If the economy's doing well, then the big money doesn't want to own gold. They only own gold as a hedge. They don't really want to own gold. They basically own it because they a lot of times they feel like have to hedge. And gold's a really good hedge if things kind of go south. And so when things go well, they basically lower their hedge. And so when the jobs markets came out on Friday, you had the big money dump gold. So gold dumped. I forget it was $35 or $50, something like that. But I do know that we were up to like $18.30. And then I think we closed down um, like $17.50. That's like $85. Bucks. I think some, something like that. But that was over the last few trading days last week. I don't know if we – I don't. we didn't actually open Friday at, at $18.30. I think it was more like $18.10, $18.15. And then we closed around 1750. So it was a like 50, $60 down day. But over the last few days going back, it was like $85 down, which is pretty significant. And then Sunday night, the, the carryover. So we got into the Asian markets and you knew the Asian markets were going to react negatively towards gold because they're going to do the same thing. They're going to sell their gold because they're posi they, have, they have positions. So you knew it was going to go down a little bit, but it, it, it went down... 5%, I, I, it went down a lot and then it corrected. It went all the way down to 1680, I believe. So it was down, uh, what, $70? So it was down like 70 bucks and then it went all the way back to 1735. So overall, it, we, we lost about $95 in a week's time. So right now we're trading about 1735. So we're still in this um, correction channel. So the, channel, we, the correction started in August of last year when we peaked it. 2075 and silver got up to almost 30, 29, 80, something like that. So we started, then we went into a, we've been into a, a now we're a 12 month correction. And it, it basically we're in a channel. So the lowest of the channel got was 1660, I believe. And, and then the highest was, for me, the channel is below the high. I don't go all the way to 2075. So for me, the channel is like 1950. So it's like 1950 to 1660. So it's a pretty big channel, pretty big correction. And, uh, and I'm say, I've am i been saying that we're staying in this channel until the risk on trade, which is the strong market, strong stock market. People are basically buying stocks. The big money says, I don't need gold. We're going to stay, gold's trapped as long as we're in this risk on. And you're going to basically see this rinse and repeat. And I've been saying this since early first quarter. I don't know if I said it in January, but definitely said it in February. So we're in this rinse and repeat where you stay in the channel and you go up and down. So gold, you know, now it's down at 1735. I mean, maybe it'll go a little lower, but then it'll come up to 1800 or so. Then it'll come back down. And it's in the channel. It's basically this rinse and repeat up and down, up and down. And I've been saying this and everybody's going, oh, no, gold's going to break out because we have inflation. And I'm no, we're not. Inflation is not going to push gold over two thousand dollars unless you get like eight percent inflation, which I don't see that. But tomorrow, inflation is going to come out at five percent, and gold is going to go go up ten bucks, and we're back to seventeen fifty. And then maybe it'll over the next two weeks it'll trend back to seventeen eighty, and then we'll start bouncing on eighteen hundred again. But once you get closer to nineteen fifty, um, that's when the banksters come in and they basically bang it down. 
Uh, for instance, a lot of people say that this correction Sunday night um, was the banksters because you had four billion dollars of gold was sold. Now, who sells four billion dollars very quickly? It's it's only you know the big bullion banks, the big investment banks, right? So were they were they basically pushing it down on purpose, uh, perhaps, or were their positions just out of whack based on Friday? You know, it's hard, it's hard to know. But for me, the one thing that I do see is that whenever you get into uh, these, these resistance points, which is basically 1950, 1900, somewhere in there, 1880, 1875, you tend to get these what I call beat downs. They're kind of inevitable. And that's the rinse and repeat cycle. Now, is it uh, blatant um, manipulation? Perhaps. Uh, but we do see it over and over again. Um, is this a no normal trading? Probably not. But I just know it's going to happen. Um, I blame them. I basically call them the banksters because it happens over and over again. And usually these beatdowns occur by the by the banks because they're huge. And the only people that have that kind of money is the banks. So that's why I blame them. Um, and usually they they pound it down you know, anywhere from 25 to 50 bucks at a, at a time. Um, and then you get in this rinse and repeat. And so we're going to see that until um, the risk on trade flips. And I think that's coming. I, I'm saying it is, I say the window opened in April, but it keeps getting delayed because for numerous reasons, a lot of it is because COVID has got a kind of the economy on hold. So we don't know how strong the economy is going to be. So everybody just keeps waiting, waiting, waiting. So we, until, until we basically get a good feeling for the economy, we're kind of, kind of stuck in this, you know, Stock market keeps going higher because that's what everybody thinks. You know, what else are we going to do? That's the trade. Nothing's flipping, flipping the change. But I think in Q3 or Q4, we're going to see a correction in the markets. Then we're going to find out. We're going to find out if this, if the correction gets bought. If the correction gets bought, then gold will be remain stuck. If the, if the correction doesn't get bought, then you're going to see a flip and the fear will kick in. Investors will go, whoa, whoa, it didn't get bought. Maybe people aren't going to buy stocks anymore. And then that's when gold will start trending. All you need is basically three green candles in a row. So let's say gold sells off. My range is 1550 to 1650. I'm hoping 1650 is as low as we go. Um, let's say gold sells off to 1650 and then it gets three green candles in a row. 1660, 1680, 1710. It gets three grand candles in a row and it's off to the races. That's my feel. It's like they won't be able to stop it. That's when the moment. And so it blows through 1950, that resistance points. Yeah. Yes. Once it starts going and you start getting the fear trade kicked into gear, I think I think we could get over 1900, over 2000 in December this year. It all depends if how the, how this correction gets bought. Like we last year, we had two corrections. We had one in September and one in October. Both times, the correction in the markets got bought. They were very short-lived corrections, very short. Within a week or two, people were buying again. So we have, we're going to find out this time. Will these uh, corrections get bought or not? That's how we're going to know. And I, I have my fingers crossed they don't get bought. Um, we'll see. Arcana Silver is on the verge of bringing the world's highest grade silver mine into production. The Revenue Virginius Mine in Colorado has proven and probable silver reserves grading nearly 37 ounces per ton silver, with all in sustaining production costs of only $8 per ounce of silver. The mine is fully funded and permitted with infrastructure already in place and has announced production will commence in 2021. Achieving successful production should result in a significant upward share price re-rating on the Lassonde curve. Arcana trades under the ticker A AUN in Toronto and AUNFF in New York. To learn more, go to arcana.com. That's A U R C A N A.com. Don, a lot of people point to interest rates when they talk about where gold is going. What's your view on how interest rates play into this analysis? Yeah, um, so I have a different view on how gold uh, reacts to uh, interest rates and the dollar. I, I believe that interest rates, real rates, and the 10 year is really important. The 10 year real rate is really important. And when the 10 year is negative, it tends, it tends to support gold. And the same thing with, with the dollar. When the dollar is strong, it hurts gold. When it's weak, it helps gold. But my feeling is that those two numbers are not really the most important aspect of the price of gold. 
As a gold investor, what I want to see is historical breakouts. I'm not in it for, like right now, I don't care if gold goes to $1,900 or even $1,950. I, I don't care as far as I'm about looking at my up or down. I want to see an all-time high above 2,075. So we're at 1730 right now, 1735. If gold goes up 200 bucks in the next two weeks, I'm like, okay, that's all right. But I'm really not super excited yet because I know that until you get over 1950, it's still in this channel. It's still in this range. I'm more of a, I'm, a, I'm in this for the win, if you will. And the win to me is kind of a one-time historical thing where you have gold break out to $2,500 to $3,500 gold and silver breaks out to 50 to 100 and maybe even higher. I want these, I'm looking, the reason I'm in this is for these historic runs. So what's going to cause that? So the dollar and interest rates marginally help support gold marginally, but they don't create these historical runs. Only thing that creates these historical runs is fear. It's the only thing. Fear drives the big money, which is, you know, gold's a really $10 trillion market. The only thing you're going to move it is the big money. Um, And so the big money is only going to buy gold when they're afraid. Because they are always trying to make 10, 20, 15, 10, 15, 20% annual returns. That's what they're trying to do. And so they're going to allocate their money for that. And if they don't need to allocate money to gold to make that return, they're not going to do it. They got to be afraid. So the fear trade is what's much more significant. So the macro factors, I always look, you know, my newsletter, um, I always write about the macro factors, macroeconomics at the top, because that's what drives fear. The macro has to break down. So I'm looking at, you know, the one thing right now that's really giving oxygen to the markets is the job openings. Job openings right now is probably the strongest macro number going for the stock market. People can go, oh, no, look at the, look at all those job openings. The economy's strong. That's it. Every, everybody's looking at those job openings and say, we're fine, we're good, we're golden. Well, I don't think they are. Because if, you have to look at the whole picture, the whole macro picture to understand what's driving it, to understand, you know, what is driving the risk on, risk off the fear. And for me, I think that inflation is much more significant than these job openings because companies are going to have a hard time raising their prices and get in, in, in increasing their sales. So they're not going to be hiring people. Um, you, consumer spending, I think, is going to be very sluggish going forward. For one thing, uh, housing, it's going to be hard to buy new houses because they're so pricey. Cars are getting really pricey. So um, all of your big tick like appliances, um, believe it or not, during this code thing, people bought a lot of appliances. They're fixing up their houses. So that's all been done. So you're not going to see this big run on appliances, big, big money items. So consumer spending, I think, is going to be sluggish and it's going to hurt. I think the economy is going to be weaker. I don't think just because there's a lot of job openings, I don't think that necessarily says that the economy is going into a stronger phase. I could, I could be wrong there. Um, but I think overall, the U.S. economy is going to be weak. I don't think it was strong in 2019 going into COVID. I don't see why how it's going to you know, go pick up where it left off. Well, where it left off was not a real strong situation. So I'm, I'm bearish the economy. Um, well, another thing about uh, interest rates, uh, they say that higher interest rates help gold because it's going to lower the real rates. But I actually think that higher rates are kind of the worst thing that could happen to the economy because real rates are going to make housing even more pricey. Um, real rates are going to make it more expensive for the government to borrow money. Um, Don, what about all this this flood of houses that are going to hit the market, though, once the, you know, the eviction moratorium is stopped and the banks can actually put these foreclosed homes back on market? There's going to be a supply flush at that time, don't you think? Yeah, yeah but that, those are not new houses. Those are used houses. So, um, yeah, so I'm thinking in terms of building new houses, which is construction work. Yeah, all these this inventory. Yeah, that that will possibly lower prices a little bit. And then we get into a recession, that'll lower prices more. But 
who's going to be building houses? That's what really gets the economy going. So from that standpoint, I don't see it. Going back to interest rates, I think that interest rates are actually the worst thing that can happen to the economy right now. If, if the 10-year rate was at 1.15 a week ago, now it's at 1.34, so it's turning back up. I think it's going to finish the year above 2%. I, I could be wrong there. But I think it wants to, and I think there's going to be a battle by the Fed. I don't think the Fed can allow the, the 10-year to get to 3%. So it's so we got a mess in our hands. The, the Fed is printing money right now, one hundred and twenty billion dollars a month. I think I think they're averaging even higher than that the last three months. But if you take a two trillion dollar deficit and they have to monetize seventy five percent, that's one hundred and sixty five billion dollars a month. And they're only at one hundred twenty right now. So I don't can they get the deficit below one, two trillion, one point five trillion, probably not next year. So who's going to pay that? The, the, the Fed. So the Fed's going to be printing, and so um, I don't think they can get the. I think the the ten year and the thirty year is going to be really hard for them to control. I think they're going to trend higher, which I think is good for gold because I think it creates dist, distable, a distable um, economy, um, and the fear kicks in. So I think in lower, higher interest rates are good for gold myself. All right. So we, we need a weak economy. We need the stock market rolling over. We need a weaker dollar. Those are the, the three things you're primarily looking at. Would that be a, a good assessment? Yeah. Ding, ding, ding. Yeah. And, and if, if I think the dollar is going to start heading lower, uh, it's almost at nine. It's at 93 right now, 93.1. I think, it, I don't think it's going to get over 95 I think it's going to get into the 94s uh, when we have the stock market correction. I think it'll get into the 94s, 94, you know, 94.5, somewhere there. I don't expect it to get to 95. And I think that's going to be your, your high. Uh, I hate to make, I, I'm, I'm always making predictions, but I'm usually wrong on a lot of them. But I'm making a prediction here that this high that's coming up for go, the dollar is going to be, an, it's never going to get there again. So. Wow. That, that is a bold prediction. I've heard uh, D DYX 80 recently um, by an analyst. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I'm lower than that. I, I think that we finished the year below 88 this year, below 88, and we get down to, in, to 70 uh, long term. So 80 is easy. I think once you get a below 88, I think 80 is your next, hit, next, next move. So probably see 80 next year or we see 80 in 2023. And then 2024, 2025, we see 70. And that and that's the gold bull market. When you get the dollar goes down to seventy, I think you see gold at three thirty five hundred dollars. Yeah, that's those are my those are my targets. All right, and you're and you're buying mining stocks all the way down, right? Or you're buying yeah. mining stocks because you have that long term perspective. You're not rattled by what has occurred in the last few days. You're yeah. you're looking at on a, at a, on a company by company basis. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So I started. Um, January, February, I forget when I started, I started collecting a buy the dip list. The reason why is because I'm, I basically, at that point in time, I recognized that the market was going to roll over at a certain point and that basically the gold, gold and silver stocks were stuck. They're trapped, gold stuck, trapped. So there's no reason to buy miners. So I haven't, I bought in only a few miners between January and now because they were really cheap and it was kind of a now or never kind of thing. Like I bought Emerita because Emerita was flying. I was like, if I don't buy it now, I'm never going to buy it. It's just going to keep going higher and higher. So I bought it. So there's certain situations where you don't have a choice. And then some stock get really cheap and you buy them. I bought Maritime because Maritime was just super cheap. I'm like, okay, it's too cheap not to buy. But, but, but most of my buy the dip list, um, I think I have 12 stocks. Yeah. I 12, Stocks in my buy the dip list, so I'm just waiting for the stock market to correct. Once it corrects 10%, then I'll go ahead and buy. So I'm, I'm waiting to buy the dip. That's what I do. I've learned this. You know, I've been doing this since 2004. So I've learned that you met, you have to prepare for dips. Um, they're going to happen. And so I wasn't really I partially prepared in 2008, nine, um, but not enough. And I, and I learned that lesson. So it's like, 
you know, you want a lot of times you just don't you're not um, just disciplined enough to not buy now to basically hoard cash. Don't buy stocks. Just don't do it. Just hoard, hoard cash. It's really hard to do. People want to be 100 percent invested. They want every, you know, all their paychecks. They want to buy, you know, like stack silver or stuff like that. But when you see a correction coming, you have to prepare for it. So, like I said, I have 12 stocks in my buy the dip list. And, and is that, that list available at goldstockdata.com or is that one of your free Twitter lists? Uh, I, I think I posted it once on GSD. Um, it's changed a little bit. I haven't posted it in a while. I posted it a couple of months ago. I think I did post it once on Twitter at one time. Um, some of the stocks on my buy the dip. I, yeah, now I remember I def, definitely did. So I'll, I'll post it again. Um, in addition to those 12 stocks that are on my buy the dip list, I have five other stocks that are on my watch list. So those stocks could make it make it to my buy the dip. Now, these stocks on my watch list, a lot of them, I need them to do something. You know, do a PEA, uh, raise money, do a reverse split. They need to do something. I'm, wa- I'm waiting. But if they do something, then they'll make it there. Um, I actually added Red 5 to my watch list today, but um, I want them to get cheaper. So they're on my watch list because they're they're getting close. So right now they print as a three a three bagger. If they go to a four bagger on this next dip, then you know go to a four to five bagger. Then I'll probably buy them. So they're in Australia. So I like Australian producers, I like Canadian producers. So, yeah, so the way that I work is I have buy list, buy the dip list, and then I have watch list. Excellent. And you profile like 800 companies. How many is it? It's a lot. Yeah, uh, I'm wrong. getting close to 900. I'm at 865 right now. There's been yeah, so, many new, so many new companies the last year. That's why I know it's a bull market. It's unbelievable how many new companies have popped up. Um, this and these are companies that have market caps over ten million dollars. I, I don't add them if they're under ten. Um, it's pretty amazing um, how many new companies. I, I've been adding ten a month for gosh nine months. That's like ninety new companies. It's it's crazy. You're like a kid in the candy I, store, Don. You have so well, many companies in your portfolio and that you're able to cover. It's a you're always uncovering something new that you like. I um. It's the thing that, that really amazes me. Um, I've been following this closely uh, since t- 2012 when I started my database. We've never seen a period where you've had new companies like this, never. Uh, but I started it at the, high, at the high in 2012. So I don't know about 2009 to 12, maybe there was another era period where you had all these new companies. But um, nothing even, most of the time, it's like two or three. And now we're getting 10 a month. It's like. You got to be careful though, because that usually means quality is diluted too, right? Um, well, y- these companies are definitely very, very risky. Uh, you have, for instance, Newfound- Newfoundland is, is a, basically a gold um, rush right now. So what, what you're seeing in Newfoundland is people are staking like crazy and they're basically starting new companies, but they're raising 10 million bucks to do it. That's the key. I'm, these are companies that are raising money. The only way you get in my database is to have a market cap of $10 million. So where are they raising all this money? That's what I mean. And companies are raising money right now in this space to start these new companies. Lots and lots of them. Now we are seeing a lot of spin outs, but if you do a spin out, you usually have to do an IPO as well. You have to raise the money. You just can't spin out a company and start drilling. You need money. So for 865 miners out there, all of these companies, and you know, 70% of them are, are exploration. So those exploration companies have to continually raise money, and development companies have to raise money too. So where's all this money coming from? It shows you that there's a lot of optimism in this space. It shows me that I think my theory's right that we are going to we are heading into this historic bull mar- bull market that people are expecting, and everybody wants a piece of it. Um, going back to newfound gold, um, I can't believe it, but I have 34 stocks in Newfoundland right now, 34 in your portfolio or that you cover. No, that I, that are in my database, 34, Newfoundland is not that big, (laughs) 30, there's 34 companies in Newfoundland, um, that's a lot. I mean, there's a gold rush going on there and they're adding, it's probably going to go to 40. 
that they're um, it's it's pretty amazing what's happening in Newfoundland right now. Um, it, I, and all this a, and all this information is available at your website for subscribers, right? Um, Goldstockdata.com. You well the in the yes in the in the um, in the forum you can search. There's a newfound uh, gold thread that has a list of these 34 stocks. So you can do that, but there's no search right now for Newfoundland. I'm, I've been trying to get my webmaster to be able to expose my searches because I actually have a search. I, you can create your own. I created my own New, Newfoundland search. You know, you can, basically, you can. It's easy to create your own. But right now, people can't go in there. I, there's uh, in this in this. I have a the one thing that's fantastic about Goldstock Data is, is the search engine. So there's 850 stocks. So I mean, you. Start finding anything you want to find. Um, that's one of the reasons I created it because there was no database with a search engine out there. Um, and so right now you 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 can't search by Newfoundland. You can only search by Canada. So you have to manually put these thirty four stocks in, which is what I did. Um, but uh, again, it's. I think Newfoundland's going to be the new gold rush. I think it's going to be the, bigger than um, the Golden Triangle, which is really big as well. And I, I would put um, uh, the Yukon next, but you can make an argument for Ontario and Quebec as being next. But you have those um, five areas in Canada, I think they're all going to be red hot once you get over $2,000 gold. So between those five areas and then Australia, you want to basically focus on quality. I think that's a really smart and then that and ETFs and then and this is coming from a guy who lives in Nevada. <laughs> yeah, you can't you can't really trust the United States, especially in permitting. It's it's takes a lot longer to permit. And it's starting to get harder to permit in us in, in Canada as well, but um it's brutal. Yeah, well, the Fraser Institute I still likes Arizona and uh, Nevada, though. Yeah, so. yeah, um, Nevada's not terrible for permitting per se, especially some of these open pit mines in these mining districts. You might be able to permit in four years <laughs> from um, if it's you know it's, if it's a you know a greenfield project. I don't think you can do it in three, maybe, but. Um, a lot of these places take five years, you know, that's pretty brutal. And the, the other thing that concerns me, you know, about the United States um, is, you know, we're going more environmental friendly in this country. And so we're, and we're really, a lot of these are some blue states you have to be careful with um, how environmental friendly, you know, they might you know, increase the taxes or they might make it harder to do open pit mining. You know, for instance, you know, Rise Gold right now is in California and they're trying to permit you know, a, a really high grade mind outside of San Francisco. I mean, that's, that's not easy. Um, you know, it, it's, you know, they're making really good progress. Everything looks good, but you know, California, I mean, it's like, you know, it's kind of, it's kind of dicey and, and you got Equinox. Um, there's a lot of mines in California. Equinox has a couple, I think they're building another one. I mean, they, there's mining going on there. Absolutely. But I don't get the as warm fuzzy as I do for, you know, Canada and Australia. That to me, those places are much more warm and fuzzy. Uh, I, I invest a lot in the in in the United States. Um, you know, Spanish Mountain. You know, I have my fingers crossed. You know, they're building a mine in Oregon right now. Um, so I, I definitely do Arcana in Colorado. I'm invested there. I'm optimistic, but. Um, you never know uh, how, you know, I, I really think that the United States is like, you know, it's one level below, uh, you know, Australia and Canada. I think those, those places are number one. So U.S. is number two. It's not, you know, it's not terrible, but it's not super, super friendly. Well, Don, thank you for your insights today. Uh, listeners, if you want to learn more, go over to goldstockdata.com. Don, I always appreciate your insights. Thanks for joining me. Hey, Bill. Thanks for having me back. Appreciate it.